Hello and welcome back to ERA 7 of the AP U.S. History Curriculum. In the last video, we looked at the stock market crash, its causes and effects, namely the Great Depression that began in late 1929 and stretched throughout the 1930s. In this video, we will be looking at topic 7.10, the New Deal, which is the collection of government programs passed under Franklin Delano Roosevelt that was meant to address the problems of the Great Depression. So let's get to it. In his inaugural address in March 1933, Franklin Roosevelt promised the American people that he wage war against the Depression. He attempted to end the Great Depression by using government power to provide relief to the poor, stimulate recovery, and reform the American economy. Those three R's became the basis for his legislative program. This wasn't a lineal plan. He wasn't going to do relief first, then recovery, and so forth but it just represents categories of his plan. His first hundred days in office resulted in numerous pieces of legislation, many of which focused on recovery of the economy and encouraging the people to have faith in their financial system. One of the first laws passed in his first days in office was the Emergency Banking Relief Act. It created a bank holiday, temporarily closing all banks. They couldn't reopen until they got approval from the federal government which examined the bank's balance sheets to ensure financial stability. This process reassured the public and prevented runs on banks or mass withdrawals, which made it difficult for banks to operate. Later, Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act, which created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, safeguarding deposits up to $5,000. In the event of a bank failure, the FDIC would compensate customers a measure that remains in effect today. The act also prohibited banks from undertaking risky investments, such as investing in the stock market with customer deposits. The Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, is responsible for investigating fraud within the stock market and ensuring fair practices. It requires publicly traded companies to submit earnings statements to investors and also intervenes in cases of watering stock and insider trading. This regulatory body's primary goal is to ensure that all investors in the stock market have an equal opportunity to make informed investment decisions. The Farm Credit Administration and the Federal Housing Administration were created to encourage spending. The Farm Credit Administration provided low interest loans to farmers, enabling them to meet their mortgage demands or to invest in essential equipment. Simultaneously, the Federal Housing Administration insured mortgages providing lenders with protection against losses if borrowers defaulted on their loans. This insurance encouraged the lenders to offer more favorable terms to home buyers, especially those with lower credit sources or smaller down payments, making homeownership more accessible to a broader population. Relief programs sought to create jobs and stimulate the economy. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration provided funds to states and cities to operate their existing programs. Agencies such as the Public Works Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the Tennessee Valley Authority sought to generate government jobs for individuals with minimal skills, making them available nationwide. The Tennessee Valley Authority, still active today, constructed dams on the Tennessee River Valley to generate electricity and to control flooding that threatens some of the poorest rural areas of the country. The Civilian Conservation Corps employed young men across the country for infrastructure projects like trails and parks. The later part of the New Deal, the Works Progress Administration focused on various infrastructure initiatives, such as roads, airports, parks, and schools. They built more than 4,000 new school buildings, erected 130 new hospitals, laid roughly 9,000 miles of storm drains and sanitary sewer lines, built 29,000 new bridges, constructed 150 new airfields, paved or repaired 280,000 miles of roads, and planted 24 million trees. At its peak in 1938, the WPA provided paid jobs for 3 million unemployed men and women, as well as youth in a separate division, the National Youth Administration, or NYA. The architecture of many U.S. buildings constructed as part of the Great Depression relief projects is often referred to as PWA Modern, 
for Public Works Administration, another New Deal program, or Depression Modern. This style blended neoclassical and Art Deco elements. Some politicians criticized the WPA for its inefficiencies. WPA construction projects sometimes ran three to four times the cost of private work, some of which was intentional. They avoided cost-saving technologies and machineries in order to hire more workers. Despite these attacks, the WPA is celebrated today for the employment that it offered to millions during the darkest days of the Great Depression, and for its lasting legacy of well-designed, well-built schools, dams, roads, bridges, and other buildings and structures, many of which are still in use today. In a much smaller but more famous project, Federal Project Number 1, the WPA employed an estimated 40,000 people, musicians, artists, writers, actors, and directors in large arts, drama, media, and literacy projects. One division of the Federal Writers Project sought to create a self-portrait of America through the publication of histories and guidebooks. They sought to develop a new appreciation for the elements of American life from different backgrounds, including that from the last generation of formerly enslaved individuals, photographing and recording interviews of the first-hand accounts of people's lives. For labor, there were also several key pieces of legislation that was part of the New Deal. The National Recovery Administration hoped to establish standardized labor practices across various industries. Its efforts included setting a minimum wage, defining specific working hours, and implementing standards for all industries engaged in interstate commerce. However, the NRA faced a significant setback when the Supreme Court declared its policies unconstitutional, citing concerns over excessive government intervention. The National Labor Relations Act, enacted in 1935 and commonly known as the Wagner Act, not only legalized the operation of labor unions, but also imposed restrictions on individual states, preventing them from passing laws that would make unions illegal. The law guaranteed workers the right to form and join unions, engage in collective bargaining, and participate in other activities to protect their interests in the workplace. This landmark legislation significantly bolstered the rights and influence of workers, reshaping the landscape of labor relations in the country. The Fair Labor Standards Act, or FOSA, enacted in 1938, addressed key issues related to workers' rights and working conditions. It established a federal minimum wage, preventing the exploitation of low-wage workers. It also set limits on the maximum number of working hours per week, introducing the concept of overtime pay for hours worked beyond a standard work week. In addition, the FLSA imposed age restrictions and regulated the employment of minors, effectively ending child labor. Although a large majority of Americans supported Roosevelt, many of the programs were extremely controversial and became targets of attacks by liberals and conservatives alike. Senator Huey Long of Louisiana proposed a Share Our Wealth program that promised a minimum annual income of $5,000 for every American family to be paid by taxing the wealthy. By the spring of 1935, Long was being seriously talked about as a possible challenger of FDR for the presidency the following year, but he was assassinated that September. Another critic was Dr. Francis Townshend, a retired physician from Long Beach, California, who became an instant hero to senior citizens by proposing a 2% federal sales tax to create a fund that would pay all retired seniors $200 a month. By spending that money, he argued, the economy would be stimulated. Although it was not passed as he proposed, it would form the basis for the Social Security Act in 1936. This landmark legislation established a federal insurance program that operated on the automatic collection of taxes from both employees and employers. Unlike traditional taxation methods, these taxes were deducted from wages as they were issued, ensuring continuous funds rather than waiting until the end of the tax season. The Social Security Trust Fund would be used to make monthly payments to retired persons over the age of 65. Also receiving benefits under this new law were workers who had lost their jobs, persons who were blind or otherwise disabled, and dependent children and their mothers. The basic premise of Social Security was that current workers would pay for the benefits of current retirees and vulnerable populations. 
Although the economy had been showing some signs of improvement, once those new Social Security taxes went into effect, consumer spending was reduced due to less money being brought home on people's paychecks. This, along with an attempt to reduce government spending to attempt to balance the budget, would trigger a recession within the Depression. Conservatives in Congress and on the U.S. Supreme Court also stood in opposition to the deal and sought to limit its scope. When FDR came to power, only three of the justices would have been considered liberal, and as challenges to the reach of the New Deal began to reach the court, there was the risk that programs would be declared unconstitutional. One significant clash came in 1935 when the Supreme Court declared the National Industrial Recovery Act, or the NIRA, unconstitutional in the case of Schechter Poultry Corporation v. United States. The court held that the NIRA, which authorized the president to regulate industry in an attempt to stabilize the economy, exceeded Congress's power to delegate legislative authority. A year later, in 1936, the court ruled against the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or AAA, in the case of United States v. Butler. The AAA sought to regulate agricultural production and prices, but the court argued that the law's taxation and spending provisions were unconstitutional. Faced with these setbacks, Roosevelt proposed a controversial plan to expand the Supreme Court, known as the Court Packing Plan. The plan aimed to add new justices to the court for each justice over the age of 70, allowing Roosevelt to appoint justices sympathetic to the New Deal. However, there was strong opposition, including from members of Roosevelt's own party, and the idea was abandoned. The controversy, along with the court's willingness to adapt its interpretations of constitutional issues, eventually led to a shift in the court's approach. This shift, often referred to as the switch in time that saved nine, involved some justices becoming more inclined to uphold New Deal legislation. Over time, as older justices retired and Roosevelt had the opportunity to appoint new ones, the court's composition changed and it became more receptive to New Deal programs. The failure of the court packing scheme, coupled with the recession that began in 37, led conservative Southern Democrats to begin to ally with Republicans and corporations to try and block more New Deal programs. The Roosevelt recession, as it was called, raised concerns about the effectiveness of FDR's economic policies, further strengthening the conservative coalition. The alliance of conservative Southern Democrats, Republicans, and corporations effectively blocked further reform legislation especially in the area of civil rights, social welfare programs, including national health insurance, agricultural programs to provide income support to small family farmers, and further labor reforms, essentially marking a turning point in the New Deal era. While the New Deal did not completely alleviate the Depression, it did have a significant impact, both positive and negative. Under the New Deal, unemployment initially declined, but there was a notable spike in 37 and 38 due to a slowdown in government spending during these years and the impact of the Social Security taxes on income. Discrimination also marked aspects of the New Deal. The Civilian Conservation Corps initially had segregated housing, while the Federal Housing Authority, which insured mortgages, allowed discrimination when determining eligibility. Discriminatory practices in determining which mortgages to insure including color-coded maps indicating risk levels, further disadvantaged black Americans and minorities in housing opportunities. This hindered minorities from building wealth through home ownership, with restricted covenants that limited their purchasing options. Additionally, New Deal programs initially favored hiring men, reflecting traditional gender norms, where men were perceived as breadwinners. This gradually changed over time, but early New Deal policies upheld these gender biases. The New Deal eventually made the federal government a protector of interest groups and a mediator of the competition among them. While these interest groups initially involved the labor movement, American business consumers and farmers, others would eventually join in. In general, though, the New Deal allowed more effective competition in the marketplace, with the federal government emerging as a broker. It also started a significant political realignment in which various ethnic groups, African Americans, and working class communities joined with the Democratic Party, forming the Democratic Coalition that continued relatively recently.
Perhaps the biggest legacy of the New Deal lay in how it changed the American government. It created the basis for new forms of federal fiscal policy and created an American welfare state in which the federal commitment to citizens' economic security grew. It expanded presidential power and enhanced the power of the federal government over the states. And it also increased the size of the federal bureaucracy, establishing a number of agencies and programs that still exist today brought electricity and flood control to much of the rural south and continues to operate in the region. Hoover Dam and the Grand Coulee Dam provided irrigation and electricity to the western parts of the United States. It also improved U.S. government relationship with Native tribes with the Indian New Deal of 1934, which ended the Dawes Act, assimilation programs, and restored tribal governments. It also brought significant government involvement in economic regulation, with FDIC-insured bank accounts and federal oversight in the stock market through the SEC, just to name a few. Finally, to reiterate some of what we covered for Topic 7.9, the economic difficulties of the 1930s had led many Americans to migrate to urban centers, as well as to western states like California in search of economic opportunities. Farmers who had lost their farms due to drought and or foreclosure often sought work in areas where the drought wasn't so severe or gave up farming altogether to seek work in the cities. The Great Migration of African Americans out of the southern states expanded black economic opportunities and voting rights and led to the call for more civil rights, particularly in the southern states. At the same time, racial violence was still present, although some late New Deal policies and war preparedness policies, such as Executive Order 8802 in 1941, prohibited discrimination in the employment of workers in defense industry or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. These combined migration patterns are what had helped the United States transition from a largely agrarian society to one that was increasingly urban. Well, that's what you need to know about Topic 7.9, The New Deal. Be sure to keep up with your reading, and I'll catch you in the next video.